In this podcast, Tony Bridwell talks about the fabric of people-driven, compassionate organization. So stay tuned. So welcome everyone to Jobs of Future podcast. Today we have with us an amazing guest, Tony Birdwell. So uh, to give you a, a, a brief uh, bio, so Tony leads global human resources with a focus on enhancing, communicating and driving Ryan's award-winning culture to support the firm's strategic vision while gaining greater competitive advantage by attracting, developing and retaining the most talented tax professionals and associates in the industry. He is highly recognized thought leader in corporate culture, learning and development and human resources with more than 25 years of global leadership expertise, inspiring, motivating and empowering employees to realize their highest potential. He is an accomplished author, speaker and consultant in the work of purpose, culture and brings hands on experience as a practitioner for maximizing high functioning cultures. Tony has uh, was selected the 2015 HR executive of the year by Dallas HR and won the 2015 Strategic Leadership Award by Strategic Excellence HR. So with that, Tony, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Wow, that was a mouthful. (laughs) I'm pretty sure it sounds like my mom wrote that. I mean, (laughs) that had just about everything but the kitchen sink in on it. Thank you so much. This is beautiful. And and, and thank you. I know we we have been trying to schedule this for forever. And thank you for patient being patient with us and helping uh, make this make this day a reality. I do appreciate that. So, Absolutely. so before we start, love to um, walk over your journey, like what brought you to this point? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the most non-traditional HR people that there possibly could be. As a matter of fact, in our firm, we don't even call it HR in our firm. We, we refer to it as the people group or maybe people operations. You know, I studied architecture, theology and business in school. So uh, how I ended up here is really uh, who knows, right? I mean, uh, I started off on a completely different track and one thing led to another and led to another. I found myself spending about 15 years as a consultant traveling around the world, you know, 41 countries over the course of well over a dozen years, uh, working with organizations of all sizes, uh, typically Fortune 500, helping them Uh, really dial in their culture and create greater accountability. And and through that process, I spent a tremendous amount of time working in uh, the the people side of the business. And one of my clients uh, who just was promoted to CEO asked if I would consider coming off the road. Look, at at that point, I was traveling 250 days a year. And he asked if I'd be willing to come off the road and be his chief people officer and oversee all the cultural aspect, all the people aspect. And I thought about it for about two seconds and said, yes. <laughs> and then I realized maybe I should have asked my wife <laughs> before I <laughs> automatically signed up. But it ended up, being, um, it ended up being a great opportunity to dive into a part of the business that I'm very passionate about uh, on one side, but also very purpose-driven on another side. It is at the end of the day, really who I am. Everything I've done up to this point has prepared me to do what I do. Interesting. And a lot of people say, you know, how is that possible? Look, architecture is all about seeing a blank slate and then imagining what structure can go on there and then Mm. figuring out the details of that structure. When we talk about the people side of the business, you know, strategy drives our results but structure drives strategy. And, and frequently we get that out of, out of whack. You know, we'll, we'll go into an organization and we'll say, here's what we need to deliver this year. And here's our strategy. But you know what we never take time to pay attention to is the structure of the organization to deliver that strategy. And we're always trying to force a, a square peg into a round hole. So for me, I have the ability to, to, to step back and see an organization in really three dimension and understand what is the right structure to deliver that strategy to deliver the result that we want. So architecture has really helped me see structure, helps me see details, helps me understand design of not just buildings and spaces, Mm -hmm. but of people and how we deliver on a result. So that from that standpoint, architecture was a perfect setup. 
theology helped me understand people. Mm. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I was sharing just a little bit earlier today. We, regardless of where you work or your occupation, we all have one component that is common to every single one of us, and that is every single one of us is in the people business. Mm. You know, our firm might specialize in tax, but we're in the people business. And, and from my window here on the 14th floor at our corporate office, I can see uh, through North Dallas mm. and identify a hundred different organizations. And every single one of them, regardless of what they sell, produce, or service, they're all in the people business. Until the machines take over, we mm. need people to do what we do. And so the, the theology part helped me understand people. And then the business part, you know, that was, that just helped me understand the, the core elements of business. You know, one of the reasons that we refer to it as the people group or people operations is because we see ourselves as a vital component in driving our business results mm -hmm. because we do that through our people. So it's been an interesting journey. I, I'm asked all the time by students entering into college, what do I study? I'm thinking about going into HR. And the first thing I always tell them, don't go into HR. I, mean, <laughs> I tell them right off the bat, don't go into HR. But if you want to work with people, you know, study something that has to do with people, study mm. anthropology, study mm. psychology. Um, you'll never go wrong with studying the fundamentals of business. But at the end of the day, we're all in the people business. I, I personally, I wish more um, school uh, courses would include a, a psych 101 or a 201 and even an anthropology class because, you know, we all work in culture every mm. single day. And when we don't understand that, it's easy to melt it down pretty quick. And, and if we had a better understanding, uh, we would be able to get a sustainable result quicker. So it's a long way around the block to answer your question, but mm. I am probably the single most non-traditional HR person that I don't even call myself HR person. I mean, my title is Chief People Officer. Interesting. So um, thank you for walking us through that. Um, to our listeners and viewers, what does Ryan do, if you can walk us through the business? Yeah, so uh, at Ryan, we're a, uh, you know, look, we're, we're a purpose-driven organization. Our purpose is to liberate our clients from the burden of being overtaxed, freeing their capital to invest, grow, and thrive. So I tell interns all the time when they come in and spend the summer with us, I ask them, you know, what do we do? And the common response is, we're tax consultants. But the, at the end of the day, what we really do is we create jobs. We help build factories. We build distribution centers. Uh, you know, we, it, we, we help our clients with the burden of being overtaxed. And rarely do you go into a client and say, hey, do you feel like you're paying enough taxes? <laughs> we, we don't have very many clients saying, oh, you know what? We really should be paying more taxes than we are right now. Rarely is that the case. But, you know, last year alone, Last year alone, we recovered nearly two billion dollars in overpaid taxes. Now we have a very wow. we have a very firm philosophy here. We believe every single individual and organization should pay every penny of tax that they truly own. Mm. However, a lot of times businesses mm. are running at such a speed they don't always have the capability to read all the tax code. Mm. And we actually have people in our organization that loves reading tax code, if you can believe that. <laughs> and, and understanding what it is that the state, local, and even federal government has mm. allowed as a reasonable deduction. And often our consultants and, and managers and directors and principals are so... Um, educated in that, that we're able to go in and consult with our clients and we do it on a contingency basis. This is how we operate. If we go in and work with a client and we find nothing, the client mm. doesn't owe us anything. And so we partner with that client that if we go in and we're able to study uh, their tax base and realize that they mm. have overpaid, then we share in what we discover. And so Technically speaking, it's not costing the client anything uh, for mm. us to do our services. We're very unique um, in the world of what we do. 
we're the single largest in the world at exclusively what we do. Other organizations do it. It's a bolt-on mm -hmm. to their business. We're the largest in the world. 10 countries, 74 offices, 2,600 people uh, around the world. And you know, while we're recovering taxes, we're actually in, uh, in the job of creating business because every $3 billion, you know what happened is it all went right back into the economy. They hired more True. people, they True. invested in research, they built more buildings and, and things like that. So we're helping our clients um, invest, grow and thrive at the end of the day. It's very purpose driven. Interesting. Um, thank you for walking us through that. So now let's uh, let's talk about what does a typical day in a, in a chief people officer's life look like uh, at Ryan? So if you can, you know, this is them. such a great question. Is there such thing as a typical day? Right. <laughs> the typical day is a non-typical day. Uh, so Natalie Ray is my assistant, and every morning we sit down and we go over our calendar, and it's it's really almost a joke that we should be writing our calendar in pencil. <laughs> because uh, by the time we get to that first appointment, something happens mm. and we're responding to the business on a regular basis. Mm. However, if you looked at what a typical day would be is my responsibility inside the firm covers the entire life cycle of the team member. Mm. So from recruiting, finding, attracting uh, new team members, which we have, uh, you know, we're growing at such a rate. Last year, we hired um, over 500 team members, new team members. That's exponentially growing every year. So we, we find and attract team members. And then once they become a team member, then we develop them. We develop them through the course of their career. Uh, the, the type of tax that we research and consult on rarely is taught in school. So mm -hmm. we're constantly teaching um, our people about what it is that we do. And then we, then we work on retaining them. So we have a total rewards uh, mindset that we're constantly mm -hmm. looking at. How do we keep this valuable uh, mm -hmm. resource that we have? Um, and by the way, in case anybody hasn't paid attention, it's a crazy market right now for talent. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're at basically full employment. And so keeping that good talent is important to us. And so that's a component. And then we have a sustainable part. That's when we're working with the business to create a sustainable um, movement using our talent to constantly grow on a regular basis. And so anything that fits into any one of those components falls into my category. So any given day, I could be having a conversation with a client. I could be having a conversation uh, with a principal or with a team member uh, about any components to drive our business on a regular basis. No two days are ever the same. There's no such thing as Groundhog Day, which is coming up soon. There's no <laughs> such thing as Groundhog Day as a chief people officer. Interesting. And what what I like fascinating about your profile is I think um, I was I was looking at your book series, your maker yeah. series. Fascinating, by the way. I think Thank I was you. I was blown away by the choice of. Um, these three difference maker, newsmaker, and kingmaker. Um, what's if you can walk us through what is that and why? Why to write a book about this? We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Well, and, and to add on to that, since the first time you and I communicated together, um, I finished my fourth book now, The Changemaker, which will come out in April. Nice. So it's the next in the series. Uh, you know, uh, I was just asked this question earlier. Why, why do I write? I wrote mm -hmm. the very first book, and I think most writers are this way. Mm -hmm. uh, they, see a, they see a need or a gap, and they want to try to help close that gap through some kind of communication. And for me, it was writing. Now, writing is very interesting for me. I am learning different. So I have a, what some would consider a disability, I'm dyslexic. Mm -hmm. And so reading has always been difficult. I mean, the joke in my life has always been, I was in the half of the class that made the top half possible, right? Somebody <laughs> had to do it. Somebody, you know, somebody had to stand on someone's shoulders, it was mine. It was, I was there to make the top half possible. And 
you know, I always struggled. I always struggled with reading. I always struggled with writing. I didn't, I began writing my first book when I was 40. Mm. I didn't finish it until I was 50. It took me 10 mm. years to write my first book. And along the way, I realized the power of a good editor who loves mm. commas and colons and words that could possibly be misspelled. And I found a great editor, and now I write a book a year. Nice. And the story was always inside of me. I just needed um, a way to get the story out. So I wrote the very first one to fill a gap uh, that my son, my youngest son, uh, faced. He, he uh, went through some struggles in life. And I realized that he needed a mentor. And I found myself in this, in this really interesting gap of being a father and being a mentor. And at one point, I had to decide, you know, it's, it's difficult to be both. Mm. Sometimes you have to be the father and you have to mm. uh, be that parent. And then other times you need to be a mentor, someone to come alongside and coach and encourage and, and often you think that they overlap and it's challenging as your kids are mm. younger. Mm. It's challenging to be both. And my son fell through the cracks. And a lot of that I took on myself personally. And so I wrote the first book to really help encourage people because I had several people come to me and say, if I'd only known, I would have been a better mentor mm. to your son. And, uh, you know, my heart broke uh, because, uh, you know, when I would say, what kept you from doing that? The response was, I just didn't know how. Mm. Cool. So I wrote that first one really to fill a gap to help people who had a, had a, a want, but didn't know the how. And so that, that's where the first one started. It really started to fill a little bit of a gap. And then what I discovered was that there, the stories kept coming. The stories were important. As I would work in the marketplace, I would see a, an issue come up. Purpose has always been very important, especially in business. The Kingmaker uh, popped up, and it was about purpose and integrity. The Newsmaker came up to fill another gap that was taking place in the marketplace when it came to uh, you know, serving others with honor, the, the ability to forgive, and mm. then ultimately the ability to lead with love and compassion. Now, there's a word that freaks people out when you talk about mm -hmm. leadership and you talk about compassion. That, mm -hmm. that just kind of set the, the leadership world on end when I had that conversation. And then with the change maker, the story is evolving even more and growing even more. And we're talking about courage and character and the importance of character. Matter of fact, you know, when you talk about jobs in the future, I think it rests on these foundations. Mm -hmm. Jobs in the future, I think, rest on uh, jobs that are purpose driven, uh, jobs that involve people who understand how to serve with honor and dignity, uh, who know how to have compassion for other people and empathy. And then ultimately for us, especially the ability to show up with courage and to have a strong character. That's, I, I think it's personally, I think it's vital. I think it's a, a message that we can't get enough of, quite frankly, in the marketplace. So a little bit of a gap. I am, mm. and I love telling stories. And so, and my stories are different. It's not a how to book you, mm. you know, it's not 12 steps to be a better, whatever, what, which I like, don't get me wrong, but I've always, I've always taught in parables. Mm. And so my stories are, are leadership parables. Interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. So um, now let's talk about the organizational structure, your day to day yeah. life. Right. So, we are seeing um, increasing amount of automation coming into in, into shaping the organization, right? and I think your tax yep. world is no different, right? So even you are you are seeing also a bunch of like I, I, I was I was talking to uh, one of um, uh, Intuit's um, head of analytics, and, and we were discussing about how the entire organization is 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 now changing the way they used to look at these things and how how we should analyze. From your perspective, like how has it changed your world, um, the automation? If, it's if happening every single that. day. And, you know, RPAs or bots are coming in. Um, where we are seeing the, the biggest leap forward is in crunching large amounts of data at one mm -hmm. time. So machine learning and even AI. Um, and then when we can 
develop a bot that can go in and, and actually scan hundreds of thousands of lines of data. For us, that's important. That frees up our, our people to actually um, work on uh, you know, components of the business that still require human interaction every mm -hmm. single day. And so where we're seeing machine learning coming in, it's doing a couple of things. One, it's helping us run the business, but most importantly, it's helping us understand the business. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, in a, we're in a full employment work economy. And so for me, um, having that data on a regular basis it's one thing to know what my turnover is. It's something completely different to know the five leading factors that is contributing to that turnover. I can score, I can go down and read exit interviews all day long, mm. but if I put that into a machine learning, which we have with our workday process, mm. and look at the analytics of that, I start to have a richer look at why people are, are, are leaving for other opportunities, and I can design development programs internally to help um, retain them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a massive research. You know, if, if I spend five years teaching someone how to do something so unique and so specialized and they leave, I didn't just lose an individual. I lost an individual with a, a vast, rich bank of knowledge that is going to take me five more years to replicate. And so... Uh, for uh, for us, understanding all these little nits and bits, mm. the good news is the machines haven't taken over completely. Mm. <laughs> right? Why? Mm. Right? But uh, the analytics has helped us tremendously. I, when I first got into business, uh, you know, nearly thirty years ago, I mean, having a laptop was a luxury at mm. that point in time, and mm. you know, we had to scroll through reams and reams and reams of paper just to understand and come up with some kind of idea. We mm -hmm. do the research and do the report. Now we have machine learning that can spit that information out to allow me to be much more useful uh, from, from the human interaction standpoint. Interesting. And then one, one, um, another interesting area that I see um, uh, a, quite a shift um, is in re-education or, or, or educate, like educating the workforce yeah. to this. Uh, I think I was talking to one of the top five online retailer um, and, and he was trying to look for a machine vision guy. And he said, hey, you know what? I have 15,000 ID people, but I, I need, can you, can you get, get me two machine vision guys? I said, can you just email those guys, maybe two guys out of hobby? There's a strong likelihood you'll, you'll just see few hand raised up. And they say, it's harder for us to email them. I would rather look outside, but I, I'm not thinking of re-educating that workforce. I would rather get the new workforce and, 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 and sort of deplete the old ones. From your vantage point, like how is, how is a, a, a people organization is sort of digesting this fact of um, how is uh, re-educating uh, become a challenge when the shelf life of a technology is, is shrinking and you need, and our brains are have have not evolved too much uh, we are still where we are so where do you see a resolve from your end we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest ai powered way to find your next opportunity check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, it's it's great. It's a great question, and there's a lot of complexity in that question. Look, the universities. Uh, I was having this conversation just right before we we joined the podcast. I mean, we have um, we have some interns with us through the school year, mm. and they're high school interns that go through a work program. Uh, corporate work program that is an outstanding work program and they embed themselves into our organization and, and then they learn about business as they get ready to prep for college and such like that. And the conversation I was having right before we started is, you know, they're having to enter into college to prepare for work mm. that doesn't even exist today. Mm. So our universities are having to you know, teach and, and prepare students for jobs and roles that that we don't even know what they are yet. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, just think. I mean, just think about me. I mean, I'm 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 at that generational time now that when I mm -hmm. entered into college, mm -hmm. 
web design was not an option mm. because we didn't even know what the web was. Mm. There was no training for web design. And so we had to learn that. So what we're finding from an education standpoint, and, and I have to be very careful here because mm. our founder, our CEO, is the chairman of the Board of Regents for one of the largest universities in Texas. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, have to, I have to say right off the bat, we love universities, mm. right? But I will tell you that uh, for, for an education standpoint, it, for us, it's really about, are you learning how to learn, unlearn, and relearn? That, at mm. the end of the day, that's where we're going. The jobs of the future are, are going to consist of people that have the greatest agility along with ability, along with attitude and availability. That's how those four areas is how we measure potential. And in that, the agility aspect of it is how um, quickly can you learn, unlearn, mm -hmm. and relearn something completely different. That's what's going to set us apart in the future. And from a mm -hmm. university standpoint, from a training standpoint, from uh, you know just an education standpoint, um, I, I mean, how do I how do I send somebody to university to study something that? 10 years from now, I, I mean, we're going to look back 10 years from now and go, wow, where did that come from? Mm, I mean, we're already cool. talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about machine learning today using analytical tools that when you and I entered into school, they were just, that was stuff of sci-fi. And, and so now every single day, we're in the middle of, and we're having to learn it as we go. Mm. And so... I've got to be. I've got to get a workforce that has um, been taught something in school, and quite frankly, I may have to pull them into the workplace in the future and have them unlearn what they learned, relearn something new, um, in order to move forward. And it's that agility I, I, I think is really one of the biggest challenges that we face. Are we teaching and, and developing our people to have that capability as we go? If we don't, the machines will take over. <laughs> interesting and and um another interesting um uh interesting thing that we see right now so there are two kind of organizations that, that 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 we see one is who, are, who have a legacy culture yeah. under 200 years they they have a very solidified way how to how they've evolved through a lot of evolution um along the way when whether it's technological whether it's um uh, whatever come, came in their way. And then there's a new age organizations. Yeah. Pretty snappy, hockey stick growth, quickly just, they are just building a culture as they are going through this hyper growth culture and have very limited time to really solidify a culture in that. Now, from from your vantage point, how would uh, an HR leadership evaluate these two scenarios? Like what what is different or what is same that you could, that leaders from both of these um, uh, communities could learn and learn from each other. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And having spent time in both types, you know, the hundred plus year old um, organization mm -hmm. and the new startup, there's there are a couple similarities that they all need to keep in mind. One is, I said this earlier. Everybody's in the people business, whether you've been around 100 years or whether or not you're a startup in your garage, you're in the people business. And the second thing I, I think that is the common denominator that both organizations can learn from is everyone has a culture, whether you admit it or not. Mm. Everyone has a culture. The organizations that understand how to manage that deliberately mm. actually make it to 100 Right, Coca-Cola, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, you know, picks a GE. So, uh, pick some of these organizations that have been around a hundred years. They didn't accidentally get there. Hmm. They they knew what they had. Now, granted, some of them move slower at certain points in certain seasons. They move slower than they needed to to hmm. respond. But because they deliberately managed that culture over time, they became a legacy. You don't just get to be a legacy by accident. You have to manage it on a regular basis. 
new organizations that start up, they need to also keep in mind that they have a culture, and if they don't understand how to manage that, it will uh, it will spiral out of control, or they'll find themselves in a situation that they can no longer do it all themselves. What happens when you don't understand how culture works? You move into what's referred to as muscling the culture, mm-hmm. command and control. Uh, you know, uh, the single individual tells everybody what to do, when to do, how to do, and that works as you're as you're scaling one, ten, twenty. 100, one person, they can get their arms around it. Then all of a sudden you hit your limit. Mm. And that one person can't tell everybody what to do, when to do, how to do. Um, But yet they haven't worked on managing that culture. And so they don't know how to scale it. So leaders need to understand, and the commonality between both is that everyone has one. And the ones that identify it and can manage it create sustainability, they become a legacy, but they're Mm. constantly evolving. They're constantly developing. They're constantly working on that. The the risk many new startups have is they rely on the one or two individuals to be everything. Mm. And everybody looks to them for all Mm. the answers, but heaven forbid they're never there because nothing happens inside the organization. That's, Mm. That's really where, that really where it struggles. When you look at the new ones, the Netflix, the Amazons, they've been able to replicate what, uh, you know, those founders had in their brain. They replicated them quickly mm. and they were, be- they were able to expand them and grow them. That, that's really, really, really critical. Um, it's, you know, it's perilous when the leader doesn't understand and know that they have a culture, it's working whether they know it or not. And if they don't take time to manage it, it to their peril, to their peril. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Interesting. And and from your vantage point, like what is the future of HR? So what what is the future of um, like something, I think, I think in, in, even in this podcast conversation, we had guests um, who were once part of HR, got frustrated by the speed and, 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 and the agility that HR moves. And with the evolution that's going on outside, that they end up finding this jumping out of it and then trying to solve that problem being, a, being from outside. Yeah. And, and then we have some other folks who are inside trying to reform the HR to sort of catch up with... Uh, this highly disruptive times have uh, like ha- highly transformational time from leadership stand up from from technology s- standpoint. What is from your vantage point? What is what is your perspective on the future of HR? That's a great question. Uh, I think we're starting to see some of it take place. Uh, first, I think we get away from calling it HR. Mm. I think that's where it starts. Mm. Mm. Uh, the organizations that see. Uh, this component of the business as simply another uh, area of operational, um, you know, excellence inside an organization are moving Mm -hmm. in the right direction. So the short version is this, we have to move away from this transactional component where HR is just this transactional, can you help me with my benefits? My W-2 is wrong. I skinned my knee. What doctor do I need to go to? Uh, and I need to follow a complaint, right? Those, mm. those will always exist in some shape, fashion, or form. Much mm. of that is going to self-serve mm. to where I have a question on benefits, I can click and I can mm. kind of self-serve my way through that. And, and then there's still always going to be the component of compliance mm. that it's always going to be in every organization. As long as we live in a world with rules, then there's going to be compliance and there's always going to be a component of that. However, if HR is always the compliance vehicle, then mm. no one is really the compliance vehicle. Compliance mm. is everyone's role. Mm. And so the future really for HR is moving out of this transactional, let me do it for you, to more of this, and uh, this word is overused, and so I apologize, but more of this strategic uh, you know, operational uh, component mm. where the people side of the business is moving closer to the front line. That's really where it happens. Look, I set in on as many 
um, frontline conversations as I do of just basic transactional conversations. Mm. So if we have a strategy meeting and we're talking about, you know, growing revenue by 10%, I'm at that table mm. because to grow revenue by 10% is going to require people to actually do something. So how do we get the most out of our people? We've got to start moving closer to the business away from this transactional shop of just doing what, quite frankly, every single individual needs to be responsible and accountable to do. And so it's, it's constantly developing people, mm -hmm. it's constantly finding people, um, and it's constantly putting people in, in the stream of their career to get the biggest potential out of them. That, that's, that's the future. Interesting. I'm excited about that too. I don't know if you can tell. I get a little giddy about that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, it's 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 definitely exciting times, and 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 I'm I'm excited to see um, where we're heading with this. So now let's let's talk about um, uh, fabric of a chief people officer. Like, so if if you look at aspiring CPOs, uh, aspiring leaders coming in in, in the HR side. From your from your perspective, what is what is what is the what should be the fabric? What should be the ingredient of a successful people leader uh, for an organization? You're going to laugh. You're going to laugh at me when I say this, uh, but I've encountered several, and so um, you you've got to you've got to understand where I'm coming from on this. At the at the at the base level for somebody in this role, you kind of have to like people. Hmm. It would surprise you mm. if I told you how many people mm. officers or CHROs I've come in contact with that just simply don't like people. Interesting. And they grew up in the transactional side of the business. It was just something mm. that they did and they found themselves overseeing that. Now, I can tell you that it's the exception, not the rule, fortunately. Mm. But you have to you have to love people. You have to have a deep, empathetic uh, desire to help people be better. Uh, the benefit of the doubt is huge. Uh, if everybody that you see is automatically guilty, you're it's going to be hard to be a chief people officer. Uh, you also have to you know have a um, a strong business mind. Because mm -hmm. it is about it's about getting results. It's about understanding how the business works. We're starting to see more and more chief people officers come out of the business, mm -hmm. come from other areas of the business, come from accounting, come from marketing, come from operations. I think that's I think that's amazing because it, it helps it helps bring a business component to to the role and to the function over time. You gotta love people though. If you don't love people, probably not the role that you want to be in. No, I think uh, beautifully put. And and one thing that that uh, uh, I definitely want a perspective on. I think you said uh, you said that uh, you're seeing people leader from tr who are actually appreciating transactional side. And I think right now this is so we are seeing. And and I was recently had, ha, having debate about uh, this with one of the executive of of a, of a large company, and and we were talking about how businesses are now shifting from CFO based bottom line catering to purpose driven. Yeah. And 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 that culture is sort of it's it's just taking stock markets by a storm. It's just it's just yeah. confusing everyone how to evaluate a good business from bad business because the numbers were easy. You can you can figure out the bottom line. But right now, bottom line has also caused us some interesting mishaps that was really colossal for many of the businesses. So now we're trying to figure out the purpose-driven aspect. And I think the other thing that that you you beautifully put was uh, business side. I think with, uh, last couple of years we are seeing amazing, say, people from Stanford, uh, Sloan, interesting folks joining HR into trans transforming it. So I think that, that rightly put. So. Um, how would how would you and 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 to many degree this this gentleman was saying that Vishal it's in the culture of organization we are tuned to listen to our CFOs more to our chief culture officer right we are attuned to yes. appreciating the numbers and bottom line and now the moment you say I want to be a purpose driven leader 
it doesn't it doesn't account to much uh, in uh, after every quarterly uh, sort of review call so yeah. what what's your vantage like how would you transform an organization from this transactional mindset to hey people are people like you have to understand that they are the your biggest asset um, in your growth yeah that's that has really been some of the secret sauce here at Ryan for for several years uh you know we are we have been fortunate enough to be recognized as one of fortune's uh, top 100 places to work not just here in the US but in Canada and in India where we have a large operation so part of our secret sauce is is understanding how um people actually um drive everything that we do right you take care of the people they take care of the client the client takes care of the other side of the business so that purpose driven component has really been in place here from the very beginning. Look, there's a very simple uh fundamental uh thought process that if you keep in mind, it helps leaders understand um where to put their priorities. Mm. So, you know, people come to work with a um with a set of beliefs and biases. Mm. um uh, basically how they how they think and feel they come to work every day with this and that's been developed over time experiences over time develop how people think and feel about anything pick anything right um so the experiences we create impact how people think and feel now how people think and feel drives what they do their behavior mm. right so how i think and feel about something my belief or my bias about something drives my behavior what i do my behavior always gets an outcome mm. right wrong or indifferent good or bad desired or undesired i always get something when i do something so what happens is we get caught in a little bit of um a, a transactional activity trap mm. tasks right to where we're just focused on do this get this and we get caught in this little mini circle and that's you know you know not to pick on CFOs but they say hey it's about the bottom line mm-hmm. you got to do this and so we go and drive behavior do this mm-hmm. and we get this now that works mm-hmm. right i i can push an organization we call it muscling a result i can push mm-hmm. an organization to go get something mm-hmm. the downside is i have a sustainability issue mm-hmm. because if i'm constantly telling my people do this do this do this mm. and then they go achieve it the minute i stop telling them what to do mm. well all of their innovative thinking has atrophied because i've been giving them all the answers up to this point and so we get caught in this task trap mm. not realizing that every time i tell you what to do when to do how to do i've impacted how you think and feel interesting So, so think about it. I mean, if if you work for me and and mm. I needed to grow sales and I constantly said, "Here's what I need you to do. You need to do mm. this, this and this." And I push you, push you, push you, and you're a good person and you're a, and you're a good team member and you went and did that and you nailed sales every single time. Mm. I think and feel what I'm doing is right. Mm. Because mm. I'm always getting the outcome. However, you think and feel something different. Mm. You, may, you may come back and think You know, Tony doesn't trust me. He's always telling mm. me what to do. He never lets me think on my own. Mm. So he doesn't trust me. And and if your belief that I don't trust you is you're just going to sit back and let me tell you what to do. Mm. And we get caught in this vicious cycle. And so from a leadership standpoint, we have to understand that what we do, the experiences we create from a leadership standpoint, mm. impact our people enormously. Here's here a very very simple example. Mm. If I tell you that customer service mm. is of utmost importance, one of our results is customer service. Customer service is a, it's all about the customer. It's all about the customer. If I go around and tell you that all day long and you attend, I don't know, pick a number, 12 mm. meetings with me. Mm. And the only item on every agenda for every meeting is mm. revenue. Mm. then look what i've just done i've said one thing but i've done mm. something different creates mm. confusion in the workforce mm. and ultimately regardless of what i say it's all about revenue 
So we have to be aligned. Our words and deeds have to be aligned. Uh, we have to understand that the experiences that we create from a leadership standpoint impact the way our people think and feel that drives what they do. And that always gets us an outcome. We've got to start working at a different level of awareness mm. when it comes to working with people every single day. Interesting. Um, so thank you so much for walking us. I think that that's really, really critical. Now uh, we have a few minutes left. So I want to talk about your personal journey. Um, so uh, if we say three qualities that has really helped you be what you are, what what would you attribute those like uh, what would you call these three qualities that really define uh, Tony Bridwell? Yeah. Um, OK, so if you're looking over my shoulder, you probably see three things <laughs> written on my board because we were just talking about this earlier. <laughs> um, look, so I write books to fill in gaps. I told you mm -hmm. that earlier. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I primarily write books to remind me what I need to constantly be doing. While mm -hmm. I might see a gap out in the marketplace and I need to close that gap, I, I write books to remind myself, mm -hmm. hey, Tony, when you show up, you need to serve with honor, you need to be compassionate, right? <laughs> so I write books as a reminder for myself first. True. And so if I, if I talked about the three you know, anchors for me and my personal fabric, I, and, and they're written on the board because we we're having this conversation earlier. It's really three things, be sincere, be clear, and be compassionate. Uh, at the end of the day, mm. if I can show up and be sincere, which is really a sincere integrity, a sincere uh, gratefulness mm. for what I have, if I could show up each day and truly, truly be sincere, I'm moving in the right direction. If I can show up each day and be clear, you know, it's interesting. Research says that we value integrity, but we follow clarity. Hmm. And so for me, can I be clear in what it is that I need people to do and what I need to do myself? And that begins with personal accountability hmm. for myself, being clear. And then can I be compassionate? You know, compassionate is about courageous generosity. Can I, can I be giving in such a way um, that requires just courage? And then can I be intentionally kind with people? Um, I, don't know about, I don't know about you or anybody that will listen and the thousands of people that will tune into this podcast, but I, I would say me personally, I could mm. always use a little additional kindness in my day <laughs> well put yeah. well yeah put. and I, so, I think sometimes that begins with forgiveness just being willing to forgive mm. another person and provide a second chance for another person interesting and uh, and one one more question we ask all of our guests to share is their favorite read the book so besides your maker series which <laughs> which I, I will i will put a link on uh, in the description are there any books that has really um, left a good imprint or, or, or good mark in, in your being what you are? That you Great question. Share? The book I give away more than my book and the book that I read every year and have for multiple years is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, it's one of the most powerful books. Uh, he wrote it in the 40s. He was a, a World War II uh, concentration camp survivor. He was a psychiatrist. Mm. Uh, and um, the study and the work that he did while being held prisoner around meaning and purpose is life changing. Mm. Uh, he observed at a level that, quite frankly, you and I will never have, mm. um, hopefully, in our life to experience, but he observed sure. that people seek meaning in one of three places in life, um, we seek it in what we do, our occupation, we seek meaning in our relationships, and we seek meaning in our suffering. Mm. Uh, it's one of the single most powerful books I recommend it to all the people that I mentor. Um, it is the single uh, book that I give away more than my own book. Interesting. And, uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. Thanks for sharing. Now we have the last question for the conversation and, and thank you, Tony, uh, for being very candid and, and, and helping us understand the world of people, leadership and, and, and compassionate organization. I, I do appreciate that. 
so if you want if if you want our read, readers and viewers to take something away from this conversation like what would that be what would be your your closing thought to our readers and viewers yeah it's a great it's a great question and i've said it twice and i think that we just need to be reminded of it every opportunity that we can and that's that we're in the people business Uh, I go back to a quote from Teddy Roosevelt from a speech that he gave in 1910 to a university. He was speaking to a group of university students, 34 page speech. And there's one quote that's fairly famous. It gets repeated uh, frequently. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt said that it's not the critic who counts or the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or how the doer of deeds could do better. The credit belongs to the one in the arena mm-hmm. whose face is covered with dust, blood, sweat, who has strived valiantly, but yet has erred over and again and again, who, who demonstrates great enthusiasm, who stands for something of noble cause. Mm who at the best knows the triumph of high achievement, but at the worst, when he fails, he fails while daring greatly. I think if mm-hmm. we take away anything is the real opportunity, the real challenge of life is in the arena. When we are locked arm in arm with each other and when we're willing to actually uh, dare greatly together. When, when, I, when I wrote The Kingmaker, I studied about every ancient king I could come in contact with, and I came across a 3,000-year-old diary mm. of a king who wrote this in his diary, and I think it's a good place to end. He wrote, two are better than one because there's a good return for their investment. Should one fall, the other is there to pick them up. But pity mm. the person who falls and has no one there to pick them up. We're in the people business. We're in this together. And when we are in this together, um, the future is really bright. Beautifully, beautifully put. Thank you so much, Tony, with that. I do appreciate your time. Whenever you're in Boston, let me know. Love to uh, break bread with you and and meet you over a coffee or whatever. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for your time. Absolutely. I'll be there this summer. Let's catch up then. Absolutely. Love it. I appreciate you a ton. Thank you for all you do. Thanks. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it And I go into the booth feeling nervous Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless Is the mic on? I don't know how to work this Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side